Welcome, Dr. Uh, Liana Apostolova, and um, we'll be taking this recording. So, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Sure, sure, my pleasure. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'll, um, I don't know what everyone's background is, but my understanding is that you've been part of this support group for a while and that you have had several lectures from some of my most esteemed colleagues. Uh, some recent names I heard, Dave Nauman, Gil Rabinovich, and others, they're very close colleagues of mine. Gil is actually a co-principal investigator of the study on early onset Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of what I'm gonna tell you about the study might have come from his lab, and I'll make sure to highlight that. Um, so you must know quite a bit about Alzheimer's disease already if you have attended these talks, but I wanted to start out with a, a brief presentation of how Alzheimer's disease was first discovered. And this is the gentleman, Dr. Alzheimer's, who was a neurologist, neuropathologist, and psychiatrist all at the same time. And it was really not, there were no distinct specialties at that time. And he saw the first case, the first known case of Alzheimer's disease that he described in his first, first publication in, 19, uh, in 1906. And this is her, her name is Foggy B. Um, she's a French woman that was in her late 40s. So she was very young, despite how she looks on the photo, worn by life, but she was really very young individual who had progressive dementia, cognitive changes, functional impairments, meaning she was no longer able to function at home, take care of her family. She also had a lot of psychotic behavior. She was delusional that her husband cheated on her and had other hallucinations and such. And after her death, Dr. Alzheimer's looked it into her brain and he saw, um, I don't know if you see, oh yeah, can you see my, my uh, mouth? Uh, Move or not? Yes. Okay, all right. I wish I had a, larger pointer than that, but um, what he saw in the brain is buildup of proteins. Um, um, he didn't know there were proteins at that time, but so these clumps of, of stuff, of, of really these inclusions in the cell body of, um, that's very sensitive, my mouth is very sensitive, of the, in the cell body, what I'm showing here now with my mouth covering over it, and some also clumps of stuff outside of the cell. These are his actual drawings from the original paper. And what you see here are these neurofibrillary tangles, which are caused by the deposition of a protein known as tau. Um, and this is his actual photograph of what he saw. Now, he thought Alzheimer's disease is super rare disease because he saw this one isolated case in this 40-year-old woman, but boy, was he wrong. Uh, it's a really common disease. It affects 5.7 5 million, 5 million Americans and many more worldwide. I don't know why my, uh, okay, I'm going to go to an old conventional mouse so, you, so we don't get interference from my too sensitive mouse. Okay, so if, we know that's not the case. Currently we have close to 6 million cases in the United States and many more worldwide, and it's a disease of the aging brain. This is why it was super rare before when Dr. Alzheimer's was seeing his patients, because patients really didn't live to be that old. But now, as we have successfully treated multiple chronic diseases, we see a lot more cases of Alzheimer's disease because the population in the age range 75 to 84 and 85 plus rapidly is rapidly growing. What you see here is the percent incidence or percent prevalence of Alzheimer's disease cases among those who are 65 to 74, uh, 75 to 84 and 85 plus. And you see there is an exponential growth of how many cases we see uh, in each of those age groups or age bins. Age is the first and most important risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. And it's a very costly disease because it's so common. Um, if we look at the various uh, costs, first of Medicare um, and Medicaid costs, we see that there are 140 billion per year spent in Medicare costs and 90 billion in Medicaid, uh, and 47 billion in Medicaid costs. Another 90 billion are indirect costs incurred by the family or uh, costs that are going to allocate health professionals that are not supported 
through Medicare and Medicaid. The total cost of Alzheimer's is close to 300 billion these days. And the other thing that, as, as we study this disorder, the other thing that we understood is that Alzheimer's disease, uh, the, the dementia stage is really the end, uh, is, is, is the most overt symptomatic stage of the disease, meaning that in order for us to diagnose dementia, people already have cognitive decline, people already have functional impairment, they no longer drive their cars, they built or something along those lines, or have even more severe impairments. But what we now recognize that before the stage of dementia, there are other stages that are diagnosable. It's, it's one, of, one of those is the mild cognitive impairment stage. This is a, a, um, a, um, a stage where people have cognitive impairment in the memory domain or non-memory domain, but still by and large, can manage and live, live independent lifestyle. And of course, if we study the whole spectrum of people age 65 and above, we're going to find people who ha are in the dementia stage, people who are in the mild cognitive impairment stage, and people who are still cognitively healthy. They either have normal cognition compared to the 20 and 30 year olds, or they have a state of age-associated memory impairment, which simply means aging, normal aging. That means that memory has changed subtly, but still within expectation for somebody in that age group. The way we define dementia when somebody shows in, to, in clinics to, with, and meets with us, is, is really based on a very structured, detailed interview exam and cognitive testing, uh, in addition to some other ancillary studies such as blood biomarkers or uh, imaging biomarkers. Um, but when the patient presents to us, the question that we have in front of us is, is this a dementia syndrome? And if so, uh, what is, can it be attributed to? So what we look for is for people to show impairments in cognition or behavior in one of those, in two of those categories, either memory or reasoning and handling complex tasks, what we coin as the executive function, visual spatial abilities, abilities to find your way to navigate around town, to be able to read maps, language functions, ability to express your thoughts, ability to find words, ability to structure grammatically and syntactically appropriate sentences, and ability to understand. That is also part of language. And then the fifth one, which was not conventionally thought of as, as a dementia syndrome in the past, but since 2011, as you see here in the citation, has entered our criteria, is disturbances of personality, behavior, and comportment. This is very, very important because dementia can have, uh, can be due to multiple etiologies. And there is a specific group of dementia known as frontotemporal dementia that can present exclusively with personality and behavioral issues. In addition, of course, in the dementia stage, an individual has to show functional impairment. That is inability to complete tasks relative to previous level of functioning. And it could be anything, but the most common ones we see is difficulty with driving or difficulty with paying bills um, or assembling tax records, taking medication, preparing meals. The more high executive, more difficult day-to-day -day operations is what we're looking for to make the distinction between mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Now, Improved understanding of Alzheimer's disease due to development of imaging biomarkers and um, other and CSF biomarkers has really helped us uh, being able to have increased diagnostic certainty. In order these days to diagnose probable Alzheimer's dementia, one must meet the criteria for the dementia syndrome I just showed you. One should show an insidious onset, gradual progression. Um, and no other contributors from vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy body, frontotemporal, so any other cause of dementia 
should be pretty pretty much ruled out. But what is really helpful is that if we have a positive biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, such as an amyloid PET scan, or a positive CSF for Alzheimer's type uh, profile of the proteins we measure in the CSF, then we can have increased diagnostic certainty that this indeed is dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's very important that we also have um, um, widened our research criteria to um, acknowledge that Alzheimer's disease can present with memory predominant forms, but also in much rarer and less frequent patients, it can present with non-amnestic or non-memory uh, presentations, such as somebody might have impaired language function somebody might have impaired visual spatial function, which I think is common to many of the in this group, or somebody might have problems in the executive domain, very much like a frontal temporal dementia case. In this circumstances, if the clinical picture fits the diagnostic criteria for one of those rare variants of Alzheimer's and the, the biomarkers are positive, we do diagnose dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. Speaking of an of a earlier stage of the disease, we have the mild cognitive impairment stage where uh, patients have objective cognitive decline in one or more cognitive domains, and that has been of concern to the patient or a family member or the physician. Uh, the patients who have mild cognitive impairment should be independent in their daily living, uh, meaning that they're able to function, even if they use some uh, aids, such as a calendar, a notebook, reminders, by and large with those aids, they're still able to lead independent life. Um, and in order for us to diagnose MCI due to Alzheimer's disease, what we look for is a positive Alzheimer's disease biomarker, either the CSF or an amyloid test scan. And now, because we are doing so amazingly in the realm of studying through the earliest possible stages of Alzheimer's, and we have studied cognitively normal individuals and have found those who show amyloid positivity, the deposit of the amyloid protein in the brain, the one that is thought to cause Alzheimer's, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides, show you what that protein, where it comes from, how it deposits, and so on and so forth, so bear with me. But what we know is that this protein deposits in the brain two decades, maybe, maybe all two decades before the onset of cognitive symptoms. And that in studying individuals in the, in the what we call preclinical stages helps us identify these three stages. The first stage is just amyloid deposition without any symptoms and no other changes in the brain. The second stage is asymptomatic amyloid deposition. That means there have no memory changes, no functionally intact, cognitively intact, but they show some atrophy at this point. They show some cow deposition. And the third stage is when we have amyloid, some atrophy and cow deposition, and also very subtle cognitive decline. That if a person is examined in isolation just this day, they would still meet criteria for cognitively normal, but if one has serial testing on these individuals, a subtle decline might be evident, but they just haven't met the threshold for us to call cognitive impairment. So it's very subtle. And this is a, a slide kind of trying to show what if, where does the amyloid protein come from and what happens to it. It comes from a very long, big molecule that has many, many important functions called the amyloid precursor protein, or APP. When that molecule is discarded, it undergoes cleavage by uh, enzymes, so it cannot be discarded as a whole molecule. It has to be chopped up. There is two ways to do that, and uh, the way that is shown in this slide is the one that leads to Alzheimer's disease. If the molecule gets first cut by, a, by a, an enzyme called beta-secretase and then by an enzyme called gamma-secretase, this orange segment is produced. 
And that is your amyloid protein, A beta. It's really sticky and changes misfolds very, very rapidly. And these misfolded um, um, entities can stick and clump to each other and really produce a, 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 the, a long fibril that deposit in the brain in the uh, in between cell space and cause and are toxic to the brain cells, and they cause a lot of impairment of the brain cells and of the connections of the brain cells. This is how it actually looks. This is a healthy. Oh my God! Why is my computer so sensitive? Okay, let's see how we can avoid that. So this is where uh, that little molecule, the orange segment, has been produced in isolation, and it misfolds and changes its shape, as you can see. And now this, this kind of misfolded protein is sticky and starts clumping together in first, uh, uh, in first um, associations of a few proteins, which are called oligomers, and then later in larger and larger fibrils. The most toxic parts are these two, the oligomer and the protofibril, the shorter uh, stands and the shorter clumps, they're the most toxic. And then another mention of the second protein of Alzheimer's that we uh, already touched upon, the one that Dr. Alzheimer's pictures were drawn, um, included really the, the tau fibrils, and uh, that's the stage of the fibrils right here. Before these develop, we have the tau protein, this really small sausage-like shaped protein on the outside of a tubule. The role of this tubule is in the projections of the cells, the connections between the brain cells, the role is to transmit all sorts of material, building material, um, information material from one part of the cell to the, to the end and then to the other cell. And if the protein that is attached here gets changed by disease, these, pro these kind of enzymes change it to a phosphorylated cell, they add phosphorus to it then that protein detaches from the microtubule and once it detaches then the microtubule falls apart the detached protein clumps together and the microtubule is no longer available to serve its function and the cell cannot function and die and we if we were to image these changes in the brain what we will see from the cognitively normal state all the way to the dementia stage. And we would see very first a positive amyloid PET scan. So this is where we can inject a dye in the brain, which can bind to amyloid plaques. And once we can take pictures of the brain, we can see the presence of amyloid in the brain. These red spots are amyloid. This is the very first change that occurs within the cognitively normal stage in those who are predestined to develop Alzheimer's disease. As the disease progresses, we start seeing changes on different other different types of imaging. This is fluorodeoxy glucose PET, which images brain metabolism. This is an MRI scan that has been then manipulated to show in three dimensions the memory tape recorder of the brain called the hippocampus, which is where Alzheimer's disease begins. It is only after a person shows amyloid, changes in metabolism and atrophy that they develop cognitive decline. And that is the stage known as mild cognitive impairment, later on progressing to a stage of dementia. Now we're lucky enough to be able to image these proteins in the brain. And what I'm showing here is pictures of the very first compound that was developed. Here again, you see the slice of the brain tissue with the amyloid plaque. This is what, where amyloid goes in this more amorphous structure between the cells. And this is the tau protein depositing in the, in, in the cell in these tangle formations. Now, we have a molecule that we can use in imaging 
that can that only labels the plaques right here. This is one plaque, but doesn't label the tangles. And here are is a brain tissue slice with a compound that labels both tangle, these this comma shaped squirmy things that look like like parasites almost. That's the tangle. And this round shape here with the core, the bright core, that's the plaque. What one can clearly see is that this molecule binds to the plaque, but really not to the tangle. We were quite thrilled to see that a couple of decades ago, or one, yeah, 10 years ago. This is exactly 2008. It's been 10 years, guys, since we have this kind of technology. And now we have no less but three um, FDA approved imaging compounds on the market that can give us an amyloid positive or amyloid negative result. All of these three tracers are on the market and the fourth one is being developed for marketing and FDA approval. The second protein in Alzheimer's disease is tau, as I mentioned multiple, multiple times. What <laughs> happens that there are compounds now that label just the tau tangle. Here is the this fat arrow points to tangle. And one can see them in here where the brain tissue has been stained for tau. And one doesn't really see any binding there in the amyloid staining. Um, same if we take a look at the amyloid plaque circled with the dotted circle. One sees good binding on the pathology tissue and really no binding on the imaging slide, meaning that this compound is very selective to tau. And what we know is that these are graphs that show whether change in two parameters, in two metrics, go together or not. One of these metrics here, what this stands for, is amyloid um, or tau pet. In the case, the amyloid binding is right here, the tau is right here. And what we see on this axis is cognitive impairment. And by and large, I don't know how many of you have science background or remember this from, from your math classes, but in order to call a relationship, we need to see a steep line like we see here between tau, the position in the brain, and cognitive decline. The more the position we see, the higher the numbers, the lower the cognitive score, the more cognitive impairment, which is not what is seen with amyloid. So the tau biomarkers are very, very important to us being able to study disease progression. Um, other ways that we can detect Alzheimer's disease if we don't have the luxury to use amyloid tracers or tau tracers is to do a glucose PET scan, the one that your doctor is going to prescribe if you have, if there is suspicion of cancer. But we do that and scan the brain. And what we see is that the cells that are succumb that have succumbed to Alzheimer's are no longer doing so well. Some might have died, some might be um, deteriorating. And um, they don't bind as much. They don't take up as much signal as the normal tissue does. So Alzheimer's has its very specific um, or, or uh, the very, a very specific pattern of how it, how it affects the brain on this specific imaging uh, test, where the back of the brain, here's, the, here's where the eyes and the nose would be, and this is the back of the brain, where the back of the brain shows changes. And these are the memory stations of the brain, again, showing quite a bit of dropout of signal, much different than what you see in the bright yellow parts of the brain that are functional. And yet another way that many of you might have, uh, uh, that we assess the brain prior to diagnosing somebody with Alzheimer's is uh, that you might have, might have had already is imaging of the brain with magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. And there is a lot to be discovered on such imaging from the normal brain depicted here to the Alzheimer's brain of somebody who was unfortunate enough to die there is a huge difference between these two, and I don't have to even point it out to you. You already see how large these cases are, fluid field cavities in the brain, and that is because the brain has shrunk and a lot of atrophy has settled in. And these are the memory tape recorders 
they're very small in the individual with Alzheimer's compared to the cognitively normal participant where they're large and functioning well. So on an MRI scan, what we look for is how much the memory tape recorder has changed. In this individual with mild cognitive impairment, it is pretty small. In this individual, it has still kind of normal size for his age. So one can clearly see how much less fluid there is here and how much more tissue we see in this image compared to the one on top. Uh, I'll skip through that slide. So very excited to report that um, we do have amyloid imaging in clinic, but where we were is that it's not covered by insurance because, of course, as I mentioned, there is a long period of about 20 years when cognitively normal individuals might test positive. And we don't yet know how many of them will develop Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and we don't know which ones of them will. So once we know all that, and once we have a good therapy to stop further progression of amyloid deposition, insurance companies felt that why waste our money if there isn't much to do about amyloid in the brain? Why waste our money on any several thousand dollars per scan, mind you, um, to document there is amyloid in the brain if the therapy would not change all that drastically? And uh, Gil Rabinovich, actually, the one that gave you a lecture a few weeks or months back, um, is the principal investigator of this project called IDEA. Uh, he and his co-PIs, co-principal investigators, this, went to the Center for Medicare Services multiple times to negotiate with them funding of this project called IDEA, which, was, um, which recently was recruited over 18,000 participants. So this study is meant for late onset Alzheimer's. Uh, it was projected to recruit 18,000 and successfully did that in shorter time than needed, which was a super, super success. And it, 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 in, it enrolled people above the age of 65 who had Medicare and who had diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or dementia of uncertain cause, where Alzheimer's disease was likely, but there was not real certainty. And what um, Medicare wants to see is how knowing whether amyloid is present in the brain, changes patient care at three months and how it impacts medical outcomes at 12 months. So hospitalizations, ER visits and such. And that is precisely what these um, uh, investigators are set out to uh, uh, tell us how, how useful this is. And um, I will skip the actual enrollment is already completed. So telling you, walking you through the visit procedures probably is not very worthwhile, except to say that there was a, a visit before the PET scan, then the PET scan was ordered in those who qualify, results are provided back to the physician, then back to the patient, and changes in the management are made. And that, and the, the, and that has to happen within a 90-day window. And here are the first uh, interim results from the study. It all, it's only uh, including about 4,000 participants. This is the first 4,000 of 18,000 participants. But what the researchers saw is that overall, regardless of diagnosis, change of care was, was seen in nearly 70% of patients. 70% of cases had a change either in their medication for Alzheimer's or other medications or were referred to counseling or other care as a result of the scan. And it really didn't matter whether they were in the MCI stage or the dementia stage. We look at these results and think they are very hopeful and hopefully the data with 18,000 will confirm this and we will have this kind of imaging uh, diagnostic modality available to us in the clinic. And of course, with a positive scan, physicians became much more confident that they're dealing with Alzheimer's disease from 78% to 95%. So that's nearly 20% increase. And in those who are negative, of course, we never have a crystal ball to say whether the patient in front of us would be positive or negative. They look alike, they look like they have Alzheimer's disease, but we were so certain in 73% of those cases, 73% they have Alzheimer's, but lo and behold, 
when we discovered they don't, our diagnosis of Alzheimer's diminished to a rate of only 14 and a half percent in those of us, not me personally, in those of us that probably think that there is some error metric there, that there are false negative scans. And I'm not one of them because I um, know the literature very well and I know these scans are very sensitive. And by and large, this brings me to, to another uh, research initiative that we just started. And it's probably the most relevant research initiative to, to mention to this group. Um, because to my knowledge, most of you guys either have or care for uh, um, individuals with posterior cortical atrophy, which is uh, a form of Alzheimer's disease that affects people in, uh, who are younger than 65 far more often than those who are older than 65. It's one of the variants of early onset Alzheimer's. And what we came to realize is that um, there are many studies that focus on late onset Alzheimer's disease, the common form. There are some studies that, fo that focus on the genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. And in between, all the patients in between are really not engaged in any research, not in clinical trials. Um, and um, this specific cohort was begging to be studied. So again, with Gil Rabinovich and also Maria Carrillo from the Alzheimer's Association and Brad Dickerson from Harvard, we combined efforts and put together a proposal for a study that was recently funded focused on early onset Alzheimer's disease. And here is who we are focusing on. By and large, it's a rare variant because those under 65 are only 4% of the cases of Alzheimer's disease in the United States based on statistics from 2017. The majority of the cases are older, but still this is a sizable cohort. There are 300,000, nearly 300,000 patients with early onset Alzheimer's disease in the United States compared to the other dementia uh, that is commonly present in early onset, with early onset, frontotemporal dementia, it's the frequency of Alzheimer's disease in those with early onset dementia is tenfold that of frontotemporal. There are about 20 to 30,000 Americans with frontotemporal, but 200 to 300,000 Americans with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And really on a very, very personal and social level and humane level, this type of disease is a devastating variant because these individuals are still working, not ready to retire. They're the primary breadwinners for their families in many, many, many cases. They're raising kids, either kids live with them in the household or kids are in college, but they still need support from their parents. And they're young, they are not eligible for Medicare. So the social and, and individual repercussions of, of this particular type of the disease is, is really um, enormous. Um, also, it's, it's, it's one of those uh, rare presentations. I mean, I today, just today, I had a lady in my clinic is I heard the most typical possible scenario where she developed symptoms at the age of 47 and for the next three years her sister was taking her to doctors and explaining what she's observing and the doctors thought that the patient is faking it or that the sister is crazy. Simply because it cannot be. She is too young. Well, there are 300,000 cases of these patients. Anybody else hearing it? So whoever is, can you guys mute your lines? Because I think it's one that is not, okay, good. All right. So um, the other important, so often misdiagnosed, and often with psychiatric disorders or misdiagnosis, vascular, frontotemporal, alcohol, traumatic brain injury, what have you. Um, and these patients are misdiagnosed, not put on the currently approved therapy for Alzheimer's disease, 
and really they don't have access to proper care as a result of being labeled psychiatric. It's really awful. Um, also what's important and why the rates of misdiagnosis are so high is because this type of early onset disease has multiple non-memory variants. There are patients who can show predominantly frontal signs where they are impulsive, um, um, have problems um, doing the cognitive day-to-day -day living tasks, but not as much, they have personality change, but they are not as impaired in memory or say visual spatial skills, ability to go from place A to place B. They don't get lost. Um, there are patients who have language impairment, um, uh, who have word finding problems, but that becomes so dense and problematic that they, they lose their ability to communicate. Um, and that can be also due to early onset Alzheimer's. And lastly, there are variants such as posterior cortical atrophy where awareness of space, integrating the picture in front of you, seeing everything at the same time, ability to dress, ability to manipulate objects, all of that might become affected in the context of preserved memory. So that variant is the most difficult actually to diagnose. Um, and also all of that feeds into this misdiagnosis rate. And what we also know is that these variants unfortunately seem to be progressing faster than late onset. Um, and the rate of first placement in nursing homes is faster. And, 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 but obviously, I mean, if you think about it, it might also be driven by the fact that their young, their young spouses as children have to take care. So all of that, the social impact comes to play into that, that um, one um, rating as well. And what we see in those individuals, and this is, okay, there you go, science data, and it's from Giller Benovich's lab. What we show here in this bar graph is comparison of two groups. One of them has early onset, and that's in green. One of them has late onset, and that's in blue. At baseline, when they were seen for the first time, both groups performed about the same on MMSC, the mini mental state examination. It's the most common use uh, scale to measure uh, overall cognitive decline in patients with dementia. So no difference there. But if we were to study how they perform in individual domains, so executive skills, the ability to make decisions and do more engaging and difficult tasks, language, name, um, fluency of speech, uh, grammar, syntax, repeating of sentences, understanding, and visual spatial skills, ability to draw design, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, more complex figures. What we see is that the green group or the early onset group has, has far more impairment, lower scores, down the press score in these domains compared to the late onset, while they're completely comparable on MMSC. And over time, the green group progressed much faster. This is how much change in the mini mental score we see over one year, and it's four times faster. So that taken together with the all of the uh, different variants that affect the brain, in a different way, for instance, the back of the brain is heavily affected. This is where the vision is, heavily affected in the condition known as posterior cortical atrophy. The left hemisphere in this part of the brain is heavily affected in those who have language impairment. And the front of the brain is heavily affected in those that have behavioral issues and problems with their executive skills. So these variants are very common in early onset and not so common at all in patients who are older than 65. And also, if we were to look at the disease I said, it's a more aggressive disease. And that is also something that we see, unfortunately, when we image the brain. Now, these are MRI scans, but they have been manipulated so that on the three-dimensional surface of the brain that you see here. This is a brain, the shape of a brain. Um, we are plotting the atrophy or the loss of brain cells. We're plotting that and everything in red is atrophy. 
what you see here is your late onset cases. Those are above the age of 65. And here are the early onset cases. One can clearly see how much more atrophy or red pattern uh, we see on these brains and early onset compared to late to match the greater impairment in cognitive function. So taking this together and also knowing that cowl burden, again, comparing the late early onset in green and late onset in, in blue, tau, the position of the tau protein is also higher, significantly higher in patients with early onset. We postulated a to enroll uh, these individuals in the lead study. Um, what also we were able to uh, uh, document as we were developing our proposal for funding is that individuals who have early onset of the disease, of course, but it's logical, but we had to document it, have a more pure version of Alzheimer's disease, meaning that individuals who have late onset disease are far more likely to have vascular changes, strokes or stroke-like changes accumulating with age or with hypertension, cholesterol, and diabetes, which are very common in the elderly population, not so common in those less than 65. And also some other changes in the brain listed here are uh, common, commonly seen in late onset, but much less common in Alzheimer's early onset. For instance, so here we go, the percentages go, 73% of late onset show vascular changes compared to barely 38% of early onset. And here, we mean these went through the microscope, okay? They, the brain tissue went in under a microscope to detect these changes. So that's why this might look high to you, but really we're looking at very fine resolution to see it. So double that in late onset. This is a protein that deposits in the aging brain. Only 5% of early onset had any signs of it. And another pathology, argyrophilic brain disease was only present in half with half the frequency of late onset. So much less other changes that contributes to the clinical picture, very much a pure form of Alzheimer's disease. Something else that we want to uh, study with the early onset study is genetics. But the question is why do these people develop the disease so early and have an aggressive course? And uh, what we know about Alzheimer's disease genetics is fairly limited. We know that these three genes on top, presenilin 1, presenilin 2, and ATP, can cause a form of the disease that can go from one, be transmitted from one generation to the next. These are called autosomal dominant variants, and every generation has cases of those, and they run in the family. The late onset form has to do with APOE4, which is a risk gene. Having um, this version of the gene increases one's risk, but doesn't make it 100% certain they'll develop Alzheimer's disease. Also, not having it does not prevent, does not mean somebody would not develop the disease altogether during their lifespan. This is not uh, a gene that determines Alzheimer's disease. It just elevates the risk for Alzheimer's. And in addition to that, we've seen multiple large-scale genetic efforts that have contributed another maybe 20, 25 genes that are associated with Alzheimer's, but their effect size or how much of the, they contribute to the disease is very, very small. Here is the risk from the forms that are, and that are, that are transmitted from one generation to the next. Here is your APOE4 when a person has two forms of this variant, one from mom and one from dad. And here are those that we're now finding out, and they don't explain much of the genetics of Alzheimer's. They contribute to it, but still we're missing about half of the signal. So this is where we think early onset disease will come in, because these individuals have aggressive disease starting very early and progressing really fast, and also because they have these variants be it in the back of the brain, the front of the brain, the left side where language resides. So what causes the disease to affect these parts of the brain disproportionately to other parts of the brain? It should be genetically predetermined 
at least in many, many cases. Maybe it's not the full answer. Maybe there's environmental factors too. But genetics is definitely uh, important. Uh, and this is going again over the genetics data saving uh, facts that I kind of mentioned already. Um, if we deal with the APOE4 gene, what we know is uh, it is really common in the memory predominant form of the disease and it affects the part of the brain that has to do with memory. This is the hippocampus. I refer to it as the memory tape recorder because really any and all information that will be recorded in memory has to go through this structure and then out to storage somewhere in the cortex. And this is the structure that is uh, affected first in the common variant of memory predominant Alzheimer's disease. However, in early onset Alzheimer's disease, we see also variants that affect the other parts of the brain out of proportion. And here in posterior cortical atrophy, we see effects in the back of the brain that is not seen in late onset Alzheimer's. In early onset Alzheimer's disease, we see much more aggressive effects, much more aggressive atrophy compared to late onset here on top. And in the logopenic or the language variant, we see the left hemisphere are really taking a bad hit uh, compared to the right, but importantly compared to late onset. So why are we seeing these patterns in individuals that show them? What are the genes that determine this kind of effect on the brain? And what mechanisms do these, disease, uh, these genes control? And what kind of therapy can we come up with? knowing these mechanisms? That's really the big question. So to this, this, how the study works is we have 17 institutions that participate. There are 15 sites across the United States that are identified and committed and we have contracted the mo most of them and are doing the contracting with the remainder. We plan to enroll uh, 400 subjects with early onset Alzheimer's in the age range 40 to 65 who are mildly affected and we will include memory predominant, language predominant, behavioral predominant, and posterior cortical atrophy variants as well. We will screen and exclude individuals with mutations of one of the three genes that I told you uh, can our, get our, our, uh, huh, <laughs> it's a long day, uh, that are given from one generation to the next. Um, these are all genes that affect individuals in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So by and large, we will be finding some of those individuals in our study for sure, but we're not focusing on these forms. There is another study called Bayen that these individuals are eligible for and will be ref and they will be referred to that to that program but we will screen from them and then we will enroll hundreds of to normal participants in the same age range to do comparison what we will do is we will uh, in order to enroll these participants we will screen and we will screen a little higher number of individuals because of course needless to say we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know who meets criteria initially and we'll get it wrong on a few occasions. We have projected to screen about 500 cognitively impaired individuals age 40 to 64 and 100 controls. We will complete cognitive screening on all to confirm that they fall in these groups and amyloid tests will be conducted in all. We will use the amyloid test imaging information to determine whether early onset or the early onset participants cognitively impaired are eligible, we would only enroll those that are positive, that have true Alzheimer's disease. The same process does not apply to controls. If they're cognitively normal, they enroll regardless of what the amyloid PET scan shows. After they pass this stage, they go through de even more detailed clinical and cognitive testing. We would do blood draw, we will do CSF exam, which is a lumbar puncture. Many of you might have had this exam. We'll collect the fluids for research as well. They will go through an MRI and a tau PET scan. So we will do all the imaging that we currently have. And we will do that at three visits, one year apart for the early onset participants and two visits for control. 
and we will study disease progression, and we will prepare these 15 sites to be a network for clinical trials in early onset Alzheimer's disease across the United States. And all that I'm saying today is work of many, many people, and only the lead people are here on this slide. There are hundreds more that are not listed, and uh, I am uh, super thankful to be able to, to work with them because it's, it's not a one-man job. It takes a village, more than a village. It takes a planet to put studies like this, really. Uh, and I really want to thank you for sticking around and, and hopefully this talk was um, somewhat different than previous, but still familiar enough so you are able to, to, to um, follow. Uh, ordinarily, when I give these talks, I have people in the audience and I can follow uh, by your expressions how well you're, you, you know, where you are in terms of understanding and am I going totally, solidly, scientifically crazy. Um, hope that was not the case. It's a little harder on the screen because I have to look at my slide and not really follow you guys, but um, I hope you derive some important information from it and I'm happy to address questions. Thank you. So that was great. This is actually the first study that's just concentrating on these early Alzheimer's patients. So it's really novel. And I know that a lot of you, in fact, uh, Dave, you, you just said, um, and, uh, how can we help our loved ones uh, that have early variants like PCA? We've been trying to address this through our lectures and through our support group. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you can you know, basically talk about what you, what you talk to your patients about who come in with uh, uh, logopenic or PCA, or just early Alzheimer's. We have uh, someone on the line who's a friend of mine from UCSF who's, whose husband has early Alzheimer's, no family history, you know, perfect, perfect candidate for your study, so. Great, UCSF, did you say? Gil Rabinovich is at UCSF. That's the lead PI, and yeah. they need to contact that group to get yeah. involved. Yeah. <laughs> So, so is there anything, like, if you could just say something about how the people online who, who do their caregivers and PCA patients and then early Alzheimer's, so what, what, what can they do now um, to help them in addition, you know, if they want to be involved with the study, that's great because it really helps ultimately so many more people. But what do you tell your patients to do besides the standard exercise? Yeah, the standard exercise, obviously for Alzheimer's patients, I will put them on um, Aricept and Amenda or Aricept, Exelon, or the thing. I mean, one of the cholinesterase inhibitors and uh, Namenda, that's the gold standard. And I would um, definitely try to get them on for those that can tolerate this therapy, the majority do. And after that, I what I tell them is engage in research because that's the only way you can help yourself hypothetically in the future or other patients like you in the future. Without us understanding um, this complex disorder better, I mean, we failed and hundreds and hundreds of trials have failed. It's a complicated disease that we still probably don't understand all that well. The more patients we study, the more disease variants we study. And this is the first study that actually focuses on early onset with these specific variants included. Um, it's, it's really a, a great effort to put through as a lot of new information will hopefully become available by not excluding these individuals from research, but rather by um, learning from them. Wonderful. We have a question from Sylvianne. Uh, hello, doctor. Thank you for all your information. I'm really curious about what what advances are being made on the diagnostic uh, plane. I know you mentioned a lot of the tests that my husband had, which were all pretty expensive, and you have to like really have, you know, a lot of symptoms before you can actually get those tests. And I was wondering if there's anything afoot to 
create, um, you know, like a blood test or saliva test or something that can be a lot more widely spread in um, primary care physician offices because it's so heartbreaking, as you described, for the families to finally get a diagnosis. I mean, it just takes years. No one believes you. And I would love to see a much simpler test that doctors reach for very quickly that, you know, isn't so expensive that insurance will pay for it or whatever. Um, and I was wondering if there's any um, movement afoot on anything in that, in that realm. Oh, absolutely. There is so much going on in plasma. Uh, in CSF, of course, but that's a little trickier because patients are not really that keen to undergo needle puncture, needle in their back. But in plasma, definitely, there are companies that focus on developing um, plasma measurements of amyloid and tau. There are several competing companies, if you will. Uh, and all of them are eager, eagerly getting involved in research studies like ours. We're going to work with uh, one or more of them, actually. Um, in the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, that focuses on lay down, so it already works with many of them. And these measurements in plasma can be hypothetically developed into a blood test for Alzheimer's. In other words, if you have higher levels of these proteins in plasma, your likelihood to have Alzheimer's are much, much higher. And especially if that proves to be specific to Alzheimer's as opposed to cognitive decline to, of other causes, such as dementia with Lewy body frontal temporal. Um, also, there are some other uh, uh, neurodegenerative markers and proteins being measured, neurofilament, neurogranin, um, other markers of synaptic function, YKL40 comes to mind. All of these are measured in plasma and are tracking with cognitive decline well. Now, there might not be that specific to Alzheimer's, but if things are packaged together, I can imagine that plasma samples would be testing, would be relatively inexpensive. If several of those markers can be packaged together on an assay, so like plotted on a, on a little like a test plate, if you will, in one and the plasma patients and then read that plate, um, this could be like a 30 buck, $30 worth multiple protein in the plasma assay that could help with early diagnosis. But we don't have that yet, but stripe, absolutely strides are being made. Wonderful. I have a question from Dave, but I just want to ask one question uh, for PCA patients. So how, it, it's so hard, right? Because they don't fall into the same uh, categories for testing, right? The MMPI wouldn't, uh, you know, the, the um, MMSC wouldn't do anything uh, to really like show you whether they're getting better or not, or just, so how, do, how would you, what tests would you give them uh, compared to say somebody with early AD or um, PPA? First of all, they have to end up in a clinic like Gill's or mine, where we there are dementia-trained doctors because it's a rare variant presents so uniquely that unless somebody has gone through a dementia fellowship and really trained in it, seen a lot of it, it's hard. It's really hard. I had and I say that you know from from I mean I've had some of my I've trained with other residents in my residency program, and I used to be at UCLA. My, at that time, one of the former residents, my junior resident, one year below me, relocated back to California and sent me a patient and said, Liana, what do you think? I think she's psychiatric. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, you got this one wrong. And I sent him a really long note explaining to him how he totally messed the boat. And it's simply because he developed to become a neuromuscular guy who studies, you know, the peripheral nervous system and does EMG testing and that kind of stuff. So he's not thinking about variants of Alzheimer's and, and those rare peculiar presentations, but completely dismiss the case as functional. So I think we should examine, and if we examine then in, during the history, it starts, some of, some of the complaints start popping out. And then during testing, we start seeing some difficulty with the visual space. Yes. And the common tests that we administer, like a dementia screen test, don't capture it very well. Once we feel that this might be the case, we start getting extra tests at the bedside. Yes. The doctors do, not my testers. 
because the testers are not so fine-tuned to tell the difference and see those those red flags. But when we see patients, we kind of probe different areas and we select the patients to put through additional testing. Um, there is not one test because the steerocortical atrophy can have several variants and can display multiple signs. But yeah. Okay, great. We have a question from Dave. Yes, in your study, do you have a goal for, say, the number of PCA patients you would like to have in the study, or is there any percent or uh, not? There is no cutoff. Uh, everybody with early onset cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's, regardless of the syndrome, posterior cortical atrophy, regular version amnestic, frontal, is eligible. So until we fill the number of patients we're looking for, we will keep recruiting. So any and all, as many as, as you know, who are eligible, do refer them to our program. Well, we'll make note of that on the, the PCA uh, pages that we have on Facebook. And any other questions out there, uh, raise your hand or, or just uh, type in, you have a question and I'll, I'll call on you. There are a few more. Okay, Sylvia M. Um, does the participant in the lead study have to be 65 now, or could he be under 65 when he came down with it? Uh, so at the time of study entry, they have to be 64 or younger. Okay. So if they're older that, then they're ineligible, unfortunately. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Christopher, wait, let me just unmute you. Okay, go ahead. So this is the issue sometimes of PCA not qualifying in terms of symptoms as far as research studies. Um, how is the lower age range also determined? Because a lot of them are coming out as 50 and above. And you talked about the person who came into your office in their 40s. I was also, I'm also still in my 40s. Um, and that often is a disqualifier for many of the research studies also. Well, no, no. Yeah, so the conventional studies go 60 and older, 55 and older. We're going 40 to 64 because we know early onset cases exist in that range group. Most of our patients would be 50 to 64, let's face it. But I, I have already a few on the list that are in their 40s. So we will see on occasion those. And our goal is, because I see you're attentive during my lecture, I assume you probably are going to, I don't know. But we're recruiting also cognitively normal individuals in that age range. We really want to have the whole spread. So if if you meet our study criteria for cognitively normal or cognitively impaired, do let us know. We'll find a site near you, depends where you live. I mean, we have 15. We don't cover all of the United States, but 15, hopefully, hopefully we'll have a site near you. Wonderful. Um, Christopher, I think that that would be great. You, you have such uh, interesting insights and symptoms that that, that would be perfect. So I'm going to I'm going to thank Dr. Pustalova and I think it's wonderful. We're going to have this posted. Uh, we'll put it on the PCA websites. Is, is it, how would people how would people want to uh, get in touch with you? So we will launch the website very very soon. And in fact, I have a meeting tomorrow. Hopefully they present me with a with a ready to launch website. If not, then my email is okay and I I can direct uh, the email to the various sites. But as soon as we have the uh, website for the longitudinal early onset Alzheimer's disease study going, I will email it to you to put it on all your media. Wonderful. We have one more question out there. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Deanna. Um, my sister was recently diagnosed with PCA. She lives in Hawaii and she has been accepted into the study. I'm not sure if it's this one. It's at UCSF and then she has to go to Berkeley. Um, the unfortunate thing is that she has to pay for her travel and accommodation, anything. Is there anything in any of your work or is there any way one can access some kind of help? Also, I'm traveling from Canada to be with her because I understand she has to have somebody with her through all of that. And I, I don't know if it's possible, but I'd be interested in being a control person. <laughs> I'm you know, scientifically minded as well. And although this, dev this disease is so devastating and so upsetting, the scientific part of me is just amazed at the ability of the, the body and the brain and, and all of that. So 
There's a loaded question. <laughs> we don't have a site in Hawaii, nor would do we have a site in Canada, but we're talking about international expansion to Europe and possibly Canada. So we might have a site near you in the next few years. Well, she's um, going to San Francisco. She's right, going to right. Francisco is a site, yeah, yeah, yeah. She she probably hasn't screened in for this project because they're not actively enrolling yet, but who knows? I don't know. They're not approved to enroll. Okay. <laughs> I know because we approve, <laughs> we approve all sites. Um in terms of um uh in terms of travel, we have budgeted some, but there is a cap on it which she would not fall under. Yeah. We're Budgeted that much for participants, thinking that they'll take, you know, ground transportation. They live in state, but far enough, so we provide some travel expense coverage. Definitely not for flights to Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. That's a great question. That if you uh, are at all in any of the Alzheimer's Association uh, support groups, that's a good question because that who can potentially sponsor research engagement and fund travel grants for research participants. That's not a bad idea. And actually I work closely with the Alzheimer's Association because Maria Correa, whose name is right there on top of the slide, she's the lead scientific officer. So I could pitch that as an idea for them to develop a travel program for research participation. So I, I think I, I could I could pitch it as an idea, but I don't know what the outcome would be although they're very, very um, supportive. So I would not be surprised if they plan it already or they start planning it. Anyway, thank you so much. This was perfect. Yeah. And have a great day, everybody. We'll see you okay. at the end of the month. Thank you, Dr. Postolova. Right. No problem. Bye-bye. Okay, sorry, honey.